Hey, welcome back. My name is Kamina Hall, and otherwise known as Kamina the Coach. This is going to be a different video than you normally find on my channel. I am working with a fellow adoptee. Her name is Linnell Wong. She's had an amazing platform for adoptees for many years. Um, her name is Linnell Wong. She's from Australia, and she's writing a paper on sexual abuse in adoption. And the goal of her paper is to educate and promote ideas on how we can do better to prevent this experience in other intercountry adoptees, or just an adoptee in my case, to demonstrate what improvements and supports are required for victims and survivors. Okay, so not a normal video. I feel very deeply um, in regards to supporting Linnell's work. I haven't done as much work in the adoptee community because I am a late discovery adoptee. This is a long, going to be a long video with lots of different parts. So I separated, so she gave some questions um, to kind of help people find a place to speak from. And I organized them as best as I could for topic, so in a logical progression. So I'm going to start off with my um, personal background and in my adoption context, how do I fit into the adoption model. Um, I'm going to define sexual abuse and my personal experience. I will talk about um, sexual abuse and adoption dynamics, how the dynamic of adoption um, promotes basically sexual abuse, emotional and psychological effects, my own personally, um, birth family reunion and how that's played a, had an impact, relationships and triggers, um, disclosure and reporting of the sexual abuse, professional and systemic, uh, system, systemic insight, uh, personal journey and healing, and then um, my final reflection. So this is going to be a long video. This is my second time recording. My first one was about 45 minutes. So I had to turn off a fan so that I can make the sound a little bit better. So let's get started. Let's see if I've got enough light here. And let's get started. So, um, what? So I am, as I've said on many of my videos, I am a late discovery. I'm a 45 year old, um, genetically female who identifies as female. Um, late discovery. So I didn't find out I was adopted until I was 32. Transracial adoptee meaning I was, I am a black American and Italian American adopted by a white family. So it's a relatively niche group of adoptees that I fit into, which is kind of how I ended up in the inner country adoptee voices group because I don't really fit in to any group. A lot of the late discovery adoptees are um, same same race. Uh, it would be hard to hide an adoptee uh, race-wise. Anyways, that's not the point of this video. Um, I, I was born in Texas and I was adopted by another family in Texas. Um, and I am currently, yeah, 45 years old. So defining sexual abuse, um, sexual abuse I feel like is not just physical, uh, inappropriate touching, um, inappropriate speaking, inappropriate exposure, and I haven't heard many people talk about that, exposure to um, sexual material, sexual, over-sexualized content, and um, yeah, so all of those moving parts. Uh, my abuse was um, mostly mostly physical, but there was some other um, sexual abuse mixed in there. I'm not sure at what age I started being sexually abused. I am looking back and forth from the questions, so please forgive me. I'm not sure at what age it started. I was um, physically abused by um, my brother, my uh, adoptive brother, um, who was a biological child, and. Um, and my adopt 
to the male adopter's sister and my female adopter um, as well kind of sold me when I was uh, 13 or 14 years old. It lasted until I left the family. I effectively separated myself from that at some point. Um, I don't know how often the abuse took place with my adopted brother because I can only remember one specific event, but I know that it happened at least one more time. Um, when I was before school aged, I was 13 when my female adopters started allowing me to see a man who was 26 or 27. She was going to sign the paperwork for me to be able to marry him. And then she started sleeping with him. So that's great fun. I do not think that I was sexually abused prior to adoption because I was adopted at three or four days old. I was adopted pretty much at birth. Um, so um, what do I remember of my brother's sexual abuse? I remember him uh, telling me to go into my closet and uh, not to tell mom. I don't remember exactly what happened and it's amazing because to me, inside of myself, it's not that big a deal. But when I started trying to write this for Linnell instead of doing it in a spoken video, it brought up a lot of emotions for me. So it's interesting to me how my psyche is protecting me by not allowing me to remember exactly the specifics. Um, as for the bigger, bigger betrayal, the bigger abuse, I feel like, was the fact that my, um, and I, I think it's a, a travesty of American culture that uh, black girls are over-sexualized. I think um, my, I had a condom fall out of a Trapper Keeper when I was like 12. And from that moment, my female adopter normalized sex for me and allowed me way too much space because she said I was grown. Was I really? And I met a, I met a guy and was kind of sneaking around. She discovered it really quickly, a guy, a man, and she discovered it really quickly and, um, and help, helped us to see each other. My male adopter called the police, and the police told me that he was a pedophile. I was, of course, a child. I was like, no, he loves me. And the female adopter was like, yes, he loves her. He's going to marry her. And as time went on, as she continued to enable me in this situation, she started um, sleeping with him and became, fell in love with him. And as a result of that is the reason why I left home when I was 14 or 15. She called the police, told the police um, that she didn't feel safe. And um, they waited there until I packed my clothes for me to leave. I said, where do you want me to go? And we don't care, but you can't stay here. Interesting. So for me, that was the bigger betrayal. However, I do believe that the sexual abuse by the adopted brother is what brought me to that point. Being very careless with my body, um, giving sex to get love. I did a lot of uh, not having any respect for my body. So, um, so that's the long and short of the abuse experience. And if uh, you follow the channel and you want a more in-depth description of any of this stuff, just flow through the videos you'll find, especially in 2020 when I was going through my reunion journey, you'll find a more um, in-depth description of what was going on in my life during that time, those times, those years. Um, so we're going to move on to the next section, sexual abuse and adoption dynamics. So we're going to talk about the follow-up uh, after adoption, and there's 
In my case, there was none. I don't know what adoption's like these days, but I doubt in the United States there's much accountability to adoptive parents. And I feel like there should be follow-up until a child is in the United States 18 legal age, I think, or for as long as the child is still in the home, I feel like somebody should be checking in. I think that it would help mitigate a lot of this abuse. Who knows? I could be wrong, but um, who do I turn to <laughs> for help? Um, well, the truth is, is I didn't really feel like I had anyone to turn to for help. And uh, going back to the, the follow-up, you know, if my adopters would have had a follow-up agency, they wouldn't have been able to hide my adoption from me for 32 years. So not sexual abuse related, but still abuse. Um, I feel like parents, so moving on to another question, I feel like parents and adopt, adoptive parents and adoptive siblings aren't assessed enough. And I don't feel like they should just be assessed. I think they should be required to attend therapy sessions and actually get a report back from the therapist before these people are allowed to adopt. And I feel like that therapy should be individual and ongoing during the life of the adoption and free for the adoptee for the duration of their life, um, sexual abuse or no. Um, pre and post education ab about abuse. I mean, I've, I've just learned about adoption. 2020 was when I began to learn about adoption and, and how detrimental it can be. I certainly have not seen any education about for adoptees for sexual abuse. Um, should there be? Absolutely. I think that knowing was a big part of my healing journey. Uh, knowing and understanding was the, the first step for me. So there need, does, is there enough? I will obviously know since I wasn't aware of it. And should there be more? Absolutely. Obviously, again, because, because I wasn't aware of it. Um, so next question is, what would you like to say about not being believed? Um, Apparently, so when I was older, my female adopter's biological son stopped talking to her for a while, and I was quite resentful of how pained she was about it. And I, it was the first time I had said something to her, and I was an adult-ish at the time, maybe 19, 20 maybe. And I was fed up on the way that she doted on him and I kind of blurted out that he had abused me and she started crying. Oh, I didn't think you'd remember. I'm like, do you know? She said that I told her I don't remember that. Again, it's amazing how the psyche protects us. I don't remember that. So also don't know if that's true because she lies a lot. And she said that she took me to the doctor. I don't know if that was a therapist or not who said that they didn't believe that I was, would remember it. They were wrong. And, you know, they have been wrong about a whole lot of things when it comes to adoption, haven't they? Anyhow, um, in regards to the, the bigger, <laughs> if there's such a thing, uh, abuse, um, then basically signing me off to a grown man as a child um, my, uh, male adopter's sister told me she thought I was lying, and he said that I was, um, a whore and a drug addict, and my female adopter's sister, um, said that I just needed, as, and I'm an, as an adult talking to her about this, that I just needed to get over it and be grateful. Uh, oh, and that she, and she didn't believe any of the stuff that I said about her sister, because you know, that's her sister, and how could her sister possibly do something so heinous? So, um, of course, I'm not believed by 
um, bio, the people who are biologically related to these people, I don't, I doubt that they ever had a connection to me to begin with. Um, so let's move on to emotional and psychological effects, although we've been talking about that quite a bit already. Um, how do you better understand your behavior after sexual abuse occurs in relationship, in relation to adopted family dynamics? I feel like that's a very convoluted question. However, I do feel like, um, The amount of families that abuse a biological child is astronomical. If a family can see fit to abuse a child that is biologically theirs, how much more vulnerable is a child that doesn't share DNA? And that's what I take um, after the fact. How much more vulnerable are those of us who are taken into homes for which we don't share, in which we don't share DNA with anyone? How vulnerable are we? Because even blood children are vulnerable to this. So how much more vulnerable then are us adopted children? Us adopted children who don't look like you. It is easy, and, and I feel like people are not even aware of the othering going on in their brain. It's so, it makes it so much easier when a child doesn't share your DNA and doesn't look like you. <sighs> um, what role do expectations of gratefulness play in relation to, mm, well, like I said, uh, my, my female adopter sister did, told me she didn't understand why I couldn't just be grateful. Um, however, um, being a late discovery adoptee, not having found out until I was 32 that I was adopted, I do feel like I wasn't brought up with this um, cloud of expected gratefulness that I should be grateful that they, res they, they rescued me because I believed that I was their biological child until I was a full-grown adult. So luckily or unluckily, I didn't grow up with that shadow over me. Although there are some grateful adoptees out there, I mean, more power to them, but I'm really thankful that I, I didn't have to wear that coat. Um, what would you like to say about reporting sexual abuse to relevant authorities? I would never. Um, I don't think there's a statu statutory, sta statute of limitations for for sexual abuse of children in Texas. However, it was a cop that told me to leave at 14 or 15 when my female adopter put me out. I know that there's no justice in the criminal justice system for brown and black people. So even if I was almost guaranteed to win, I would not report it to this day. I wouldn't because I would be subjecting myself to so much more pain and suffering and I, I'm not willing to do that. Um, and that's just my own personal, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for anybody else, but that's how. Also, also, the, the white cape that's put on to adopters especially white adopters, so for inner country adoptees often adopted into white families as a transracial adoptee adopted into a white family. Oh, bless these white, these wonderful white people for saving this little yellow, brown, or black child that, what would they be doing otherwise? I mean, and that's a thing. So much, much, I think much less likely to believe, be believed when you come from a society that sees adopters like that. Um, shame, feelings of shame connected to sexual abuse, man, um, I've already spoken on not feeling like my body was worth preserving. It made me very sexually promiscuous, very, very young. 
I didn't know what it was to value my body because my body had never been valued. And it wasn't until I was much, much older that I was able to find value in myself and therefore start valuing my body in a, in a, in a relevant way to protect me. I wasn't able to protect, um, nobody protected my child and then I didn't protect my inner child. So I had to find a way to forgive myself for that and um, begin to start protecting myself and actually having a sense of um, pride about my body. And it took a lot and I didn't even realize, gosh, until I was mid-twenties, I don't know, maybe later. In fact, I don't even think I realized the man part of it was abuse until I saw a movie about a director. A director made a, story, a, a movie about her experience with an abuser and it was the same as she began to reflect on it. She thought that she was in a relationship with this man and it was the same for me until I was much older so I didn't even begin reckoning with this stuff until I was an adult. Um, how do you manage ongoing adoptive family relationships? Well, I cut ties and that's the next question about cutting ties. I cut ties. I cut ties about 12 years ago, best decision I've ever made. Absolute best decision I've ever made. I don't know how anyone can heal with continued exposure to abuse. I don't even, I have no clue how that's possible, but I know that I can't. And when I was cutting ties, that's the first time I ever expressed my anger and frustration towards my adoptive, my female adopter for feeding me to her predator son. And I didn't say anything about the predator man, but I, I kind of wish I would have. And um, I never regret it. If you're considering doing it, I highly recommend it. Um, not because they didn't give you money, but if you, you're an adoptee who faced sexual abuse and you've not been validated and they're not doing anything to make you feel safe protected and seen and heard, cut them off. Best decision I've ever made. There is a group for adoptees that have cut ties. Um, it's, it's so liberating. I, I have not missed them because I never had them. I miss the idea of a family, but I never had that really. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's move on to birth family reunion. So how did this paint my reunion? Well, I didn't have to contemplate telling my birth mother because I have a channel and I said all the things I needed for her to know in a video before I'd even found her. And she had already binge watched all my videos, I think, before we had our first conversation, maybe before our second conversation. And so pro and con, it's good because even though I didn't feel emotionally attached to her, I did have a regression, which a lot of adoptees talk about in reunion, a regression to this childlike state. And so not being able to really like express myself verbally. So I'm really glad that I said what I needed to say in videos before I met her, especially about race. Um, my father um, had already passed before I started reunion process and um, I don't know that uh, my sister is the only person I've talked to really in depth on my father's side, but I think there's so much dysfunction on that side anyways that it just, everybody's just trying to keep their heads above water. Um, so I experienced secondary rejection with my mother and um, part of that may be due to her guilt, uh, guilt inspired by knowing what I went through, but probably also some guilt related to race things. I don't know, but um, she did try to come back around uh, another time, but 
once I'm done, I'm done. And um, first time she had control, second time she had control, I will not allow for that to happen again. So she decided to cut ties and I've decided to keep it that way. Was, did the sexual abuse have something to do with it? Probably her guilt surrounding what I faced after, who knows? Relationships or lack thereof and triggers. So, um, what's been the impact on my intimate relationships? Well, I mean, I don't know if it's just the sexual part of it or just the whole adoption part of it and how dysfunctional the family was, but I can't have a healthy relationship. I, I don't know how, I've never seen it modeled. I studied them a lot. I don't think I have the temperament for it. Um, Sexually, I think that I am, or I was, I, mean, I think I still am pretty open-minded, which I think was a result of, of that um, very experimental and open to alternative relationship styles for a very long time. And, I, and I'm not against people choosing it for themselves. I'm just, for me, Simple is better. Too many moving parts in my life is not, it's not functional. Um, it doesn't work for me. Um, so I'm single. I may have a friend, but I don't want that um, traditional connection. Um, and I think it's tied to all of the trauma, not just the sexual trauma. Um, I think one of the biggest triggers for me um, with sexual abuse is um, in a new sexual encounter when a man reaches for my throat. I hate that. I hate it. And all of the layers of things that it brings up for me, not just for my sexual abuse, but just patriarchy and dominant, male dominance over women, and oh, I, I hate it. So I will slap a man's hand away if they dare do that. I don't know if that's a thing in same-sex relationships. I don't think so. Um, it may be male and male, but it seems like a very male thing to reach for someone's neck. It's a trigger. Um, you probably won't see me again if something like that happens. Um, Sensory wise, especially as I get older, I'm very protective of my genitalia. And when I feel like something's wrong or amiss, and it might have been as a result of someone, they're also not likely to see. That's a big, hmm, I don't even know how to say it. I feel infringed upon and I'm almost mad at myself because. I failed to protect, protect myself, and I don't mean like a condom protect myself, I mean just you know, even condoms giving me some kind of discomfort, and then I end up mad at the person because I'm mad at myself because I feel like I haven't protected myself the way that I needed to. Um, there's a question about religion, but religion wasn't a thing for me in my adoptive family. In fact, it was quite the opposite. They were quite, the adoptive mother was quite um, anti-religion. So let's move on to disclosure and reporting. We're just over halfway through now at 28 minutes. So like I said, long video. Um, I've already just talked about who I told and how that went, <laughs> what needs to be improved. I, I don't even have a suggestion for that. Like I said, a continual supervision from wherever the child came from, I think should be mandatory until the child is, is out of the home. But again, you know, I was hidden. I was a hidden child. I was lied to. So somebody coming in and out of my home would have, would have blown their cover. Um, finding professionally trained professional support. Um, appropriately appropriately trained professional support. Good luck with that. Um, while there is a directory of adoption-informed therapists on 
Manel's website, Intercountry Adoptee Voices. I'll say that again, Intercountry Adoptee Voices. ICAV, you can find a list of adoption informed therapists on her um, website. Unfortunately, there's just lots of barriers to accessing these people, very long waiting lists. If you're in the United States, um, there's licensure issues from state to state. If you live in one state and the therapist lives in another state. And then even outside of adoption, just finding a therapist that you vibe with because I've gone through tons. Um, it's hard. I think that um, adoption should be part of training for, or, or if somebody is looking to specialize, it should be extra, like um, somebody specializes in something else in medicine, it should be a, a very serious educational program for people who want to offer this help for adoptees, but that's just not, that help is just isn't out there. Um, so, keep going. So we'll move on to professional and systemic insight. What would you like mental health professionals, counselors? So the next one, what f facilitators of adoption, mental health professionals, law enforcement, and adoptive parents, what do I want them to know? The same things that I've already said. I want them to know that a child that is adopted who doesn't share your blood and doesn't look like you is more susceptible to sexual abuse and that everyone should be aware of that. I think that if law enforcement is called out on a call and they recognize that a child is different from the family, that they should make an effort to engage that child to make sure they're okay. I think adoptive parents should get therapy before they, at least a year before they're considering adopting a child and they should be getting actively, individually getting therapy the whole time because you have some stuff with you and, and that child doesn't deserve it. And you're more likely to give it to a child who is not the same color as you and who doesn't share your blood, whether you believe it or not. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that there. Uh, my personal journey and the healing. I've been on a healing journey for over 20 years before I even knew I was adopted. I was working on early childhood trauma. I mean, I've been on my own since I was 14 or 15, so obviously there was some stuff to work out there. Um, <laughs> so it's been a it's been a long journey, and it's after after you hit adulthood, it does become your responsibility. And so I'd like fellow adoptees and survivors of sexual abuse to know that you're not alone. You're not alone. Um, you're not the only one. It's hard and it gets harder before it gets easier. But if you choose to go the healing route, that um, it's worth it. And sometimes the, the hurt part of it, the bad part of it, can last a lot longer than you thought it would. But it's still worth it at the end of the day. Do the work. Don't try to find a therapist and set a timeline like, by the end of the year, I want to be fine with this. Because it doesn't really work like that. Um, which goes into the next question about healing journey. It's just that. It's a journey and it's a lifelong journey. Though I'm a lot better than I was, I personally had to use psychedelic mushrooms to access a lot of parts of me that I had hidden away to protect myself. And though I feel different after and I felt more open and accessible, that doesn't mean that my pain stopped then. And it took me a good year and a half of suffering and anguish before I started to feel better. You just can't come into it thinking like, oh, I'm just gonna get better and then I'm gonna forget it and turn the page on and keep going. And that's not true, it's just not true. There'll be good days and there'll be bad days for the rest of your life. It's a lifelong journey. 
Um, so what supports have I found most helpful? So, uh, like I said, there, um, Linnell has a group on, on Facebook called Inner Country Adopting Voices, ICAV. You can find the link in the description of this video. She also has a website. Um, there is a Facebook group for adoptees who have cut ties. I found that very beneficial. Um, I didn't stay in a lot of the other adoptee forums. Um, adoptees are, are a lot of things, but we're full of emotion. And um, as a very empathic person, it's just too much for me. Um, so I couldn't be in a lot of adoptee groups. I did connect with one or two adoptees that I found special. Um, I'm not in any groups anymore. I just, I'm not a group person. Um, I think the biggest way, the, the biggest support um, that I have found has been from my little, my Facebook community is like 20 friends. These are all people that I know very, very well. And as I started moving through this journey, it was really nice how people started just checking on me to make sure that I was okay because I wasn't. And it was nice to have their support. Um, again, shout out to Linnell's group. Um, she does a spectacular job of moderating that group. I, I felt relatively safe there. Uh, what are some what are some barriers to finding support for adoptees who have survived sexual abuse? Well, I mean, just the acknowledgement that adoption is a problem. Um, just again, the lack of all the things that we've talked about. There are not a lot of adoption informed therapists to begin with. So how do you find uh, adoption informed, trauma informed, or sexual abuse informed? therapist that's also, you know, adoption informed. I mean, it's just not something people talk about readily. So I think just awareness is probably one of the biggest barriers. And because people aren't aware that there is a need, usually when people are, are there, there are aware that there is a need, they will do something to try to fill the need. But I don't think anybody's aware that there's this need other than adoptees. Um, what supports are missing that would have been helpful as an adoptee and sexual abuse survivor? I think every child that's adopted domestically or internationally, transracial, transracially, any of that stuff, I think that we should all have free access to therapy for life. For life. For life. <laughs> and I think there should be social services just for us, uh, not just therapy. I think there should be social services just for us. Um, adoptees are 15% more likely for all the things, uh, drug abuse, excuse me, drug abuse, alcoholism, going to prison, um, all those things, we're 15% we're more likely. Um, if nothing else, if you don't care about anything else, you should care about the fact that it's harmful for society to have such a big chunk of society not well. And while there are adoptees who think that they're okay, there are a large chunk of us that aren't, and know that we're not. And having better social services, access to su support that is informed would be nice. Um, anything else I'd like to share about my experience? I mean, you know, I'm a very niche adoptee. Um, there's a huge population of Korean adoptees, huge population. It's a shame what they did to them, but they have a community. It doesn't matter what country they were adopted out to. There's a huge community that has something in common. So when you narrow that down a little bit further to, so I'm a transracial adoptee. Yes, yes, lots of transracial adoptees. Inner country adoptees are transracial adoptees as well. Um, I mean, unless you were adopted to a Korean American family. 
most of us are, are most of them are transracial adoptees as well but then you add on to that so I'm not an international adoptee I'm a domestic transracial late discovery most late discoveries are much older because that was the era when doctors were telling adoptive parents that they can't remember and it doesn't make any difference so most late discovery adoptees are, are a generation ahead of me a lot of baby boomers are, are late discovery adoptees so in late discovery adoptee forums because most of them are white um, because how could you not know you're adopted and be adopted by white people and be brown so um, late discovery adoptee forums are very white I'm very black <laughs> in my, my mindset so I don't fit in there transracial you know most of those people knew their whole lives I just don't really fit in anywhere and I've gotten to a point where um, that's okay so if you're feeling, I feel like if you're feeling isolated or singled out, that that's okay. It's okay. I think the scariest part for us as pack animals, we know that we're safe when we're in a group that looks like us, shares and experiences us. And it can be very scary when you can't find that. But the truth is that we are not tribal anymore and we don't need the tribe to survive. So because you don't fit in to perfectly fit in somewhere doesn't make you not okay. You're still, you can still survive without a tribe. So I'll leave it there. Uh, again, a very different video than from what I usually do, 42 minutes and counting. Um, again, my name is Camino Hall, also known as Camino the Coach, and I hope that you'll come back. Um, always, always, always sending love, light, peace, and joy. Until next time, again, I'm Camino the Coach.